So my name is Frank Yang. So that's the title of the talk today. Um, by the way, we didn't get the permission to use the logo and their name. So, um, but they are here in the audience. So um, I'd like to take the time to uh, thank our partner there. Uh, they had the vision to start this uh, uh, project, and so we we are just very um, um, fortunate, appreciative to, to be invited on the journey. Right with that. So, the starting point, like um, the starting point of this project. So, hundred years of um, sports um, is a um, very large set of data, and these are mostly video uh, video data. Right. Uh, and so, the motivation there is that these data today are stuck on a, um, a large and um, growing. That the the data is stuck on. Um, um, tape today, right? And it's a large growing media data. Okay. Now, these aren't just regular data. These are irre re irreplaceable data. They're not just test data that we can uh, regenerate. Um, they're of um, historical and cultural importance. So a lot of this motivation is around preservation, making sure the data is available, not just now, but for uh, future generation. There are the crown jewels of the league. And so in addition to preserving the data, uh, we want to be able to actually do something with it. So it's not about just preserving the data, but to be able to compute on it, to put uh, analytics on it, um, and um, uh, monetize on it. Okay. So what kind of infrastructure, you know, what kind of storage we need? Okay. So this is where uh, the motivation is to uh, open up uh, this infrastructure, not just for today, for future. Um, the, the size of the data is growing, and the type of data that's going to be put in there are also changing. Right. So these days, not only do we have more cameras, uh, more angles, uh, we have higher frame rates, we have data now that are not video. Right? You're talking about the, uh, the, the metrics, uh, not just from the game itself, but from the audience, from you know, other uh, use cases uh, in the stadium. Uh, and so the requirements uh, for putting this um, infrastructure together is that uh, not only do we have to have robust data, uh, we want to have fast access to these data. Um, uh, the data needs to be um, not only highly available, but uh, needs to be accessible from multiple sites anywhere, anytime, okay, at the fastest speed that we can, um, we can make possible. Uh, we want to be free from any vendor lock-in, okay, so hence Ceph and other open sources you'll see later that are used uh, in, in, in this project. Uh, and fundamentally, you know, the, the cost structure of this needs to be better than uh, just Dumping this cloud, uh, these uh, data into the public cloud. Okay, so those are the uh, the criteria that kind of we set forth as we started this project. Okay, so why Ceph, right? So open source definitely there is uh, one of the the major motivation, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but of the other open source out uh, out there, I mean Ceph is the only one to us anyway that's uh, viable because it's the um, it's proven, right? It's got the large community. That's why we're all here. Uh, it's actively being developed. You know, they're, they're stuff that are coming down the pipe. It's not static um, 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 open source, right? Uh, it's free from choice of hardware vendors. Like, there are seven implementation out there you know, using all, not just different vendors, but different types of hardware, right? So that's very important to us as well. Uh, and then at the end of the day, it's all about control of the data. And these data are staying, you know, within within the league. They want full control over it, uh, and they want to be able to, to do what they need with it. Uh, and so that's why we went down the, uh, the path with uh, Ceph. So what do we set out to, to build? Uh, so this is a multi-year, multi-phase project. So in the first phase, uh, we're, we put together, uh, putting together um, 40 petabytes of what we call active archive. Okay. So uh, the, um, the, the bars that we set for ourselves in this first hit, first phase is uh, one, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the the cost structure of it. Like this is all on prem, you know, in colo. So you add together all the the harbor, all the um, folks involved, right, and um, all the software requirements and so forth. It needs to have a lower cost structure than than uh, being in the public cloud. Uh, we need to have high durability. So this is uh, using object using Ceph as an object store, so S3 type access. So we want to be comparable to uh, a cloud durability type of numbers. Uh, highly available, like I said, 
access anywhere, uh, survive uh, site failures, survive uh, hardware failures, survive, survive um, software failures. Uh, so there's a high availability um, uh, involved in this. And we want to be able to scale to hundreds of petabytes. So we may start with 40, but this thing, you know, like I said, it's a growing set of data. So we want this thing to be able to scale to hundreds of petabytes um, uh, and perhaps beyond. Uh, the next one is very important. Right? It is about the, uh, the operational efficiency. So Ceph, um, like the folks in the audience here, are a lot of them uh, are all experts in Ceph. But we don't want to have to have the entire IT team be uh, Ceph experts, right? We want to make this operationally efficient. We need to be able to have folks that are just, you know, your usual IT guys, or um, um, uh, be able to manage this size of a cluster. It is not just the storage itself, but all the things uh, around it. Uh, so it's a turnkey, easy button for essentially having a software-defined storage, including all the other pieces of what it takes uh, to be able to access data. Okay. Uh, and we want to have the ability uh, to be able to compute. So like I said, it's not just the storage, it's the compute associated with it, it's networking, it's the uh, access, it's the user control, it's the, the certificate controls, and um, um, all aspects of um, um, making this possible. So this is what we ended up with. And it took a lot of planning, um, but this is what's uh, built today. Okay. So there, there are two sites, uh, not surprisingly, one on the west side and one on the east side of, of the United States. Uh, and we have a media manager uh, whose job um, in this first phase is to take the data from the tape archive uh, and then put it into these uh, two sites. And they're, they're copies. So the two sites basically have identical copies of the data. Uh, there's an extra copy that will go into the public cloud. Okay, But most of the active part of it, of the actual active computing, are done directly on-prem uh, on these sites. Uh, within the sites, you'll notice that uh, in addition to the production cluster, right? those are the... Uh, the um, the, the eight racks uh, per site that are holding the production data. Uh, we have, uh, very importantly, these uh, sandboxes. Okay, and I can't stress the importance of having these sandboxes. So these sandboxes are essentially mini replicas of the production cluster. So they have the identical hardware, they have the identical setup, they just have less of it. Right, so same versions running, um, um, same setup. Uh, and that's where all the uh, not only the staging happens for before we push anything into the productions for either upgrades uh, or um, loading new softwares, uh, doing configuration changes, uh, all happen on the same box first before production. But that's also we, where we can run uh, experiments. So before we decide what we wanted to put on there uh, and tuning the performances, they're all done on the same boxes first. Okay. It's also the canary in the coal mine in case something does happen and it has happened, right? Was, uh, the, again, can't stress the importance there. Uh, any um, bugs, any uh, usability issues, user errors, uh, are all detected first on the sandbox before they, um, you know, hopefully they never show up in the production environment. Uh, the the uh, networking um, within the sites are 100 gigi uh, networking. We want to make sure that networking is not the bottleneck. Uh, there is also uh, 200 gigi links between the two sites over private network. So this entire, um, you know, lower half of this, uh, it's all private network uh, where um, we hope the bandwidth is not, well, we make sure that bandwidth is not the bottleneck. Okay, so what's what's in some of these, uh, or in, in, these, uh, in these racks? So the uh, OSDs are in uh, JBots. Okay, the JBODs uh, are zoned into two halves. Two halves, um, each of them, uh, each half basically has a, a, a OSD server uh, that are managing about 53 uh, OSDs. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, within the clusters, the uh, compute nodes, which today are mostly serving the purpose of being the radars gateways and the, uh, the load balancers. Okay. And so when the racks are fully filled, and this is all planned out, Right, so first phase is the, the racks are actually partially populated, but we've already marked uh, out uh, how many racks, uh, the placements of the stuff uh, as we upgrade. Okay. In fact, this year we're 
we're in the process of uh, doubling the size, you know, from, from 40 petabyte, you know, to extent. And just some interesting facts. Right? So when these racks are fully populated, each rack is about 20 kilowatts. Uh, so that's about uh, 40 refrigerators worth of, um, of power that's being consumed, you know, on the rack, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the density. And then the, uh, the weight of the racks in there, if you add up all the, not just the servers, but the, the physical drives, these are rotational drives uh, for cost reason. Um, and, you know, it's an act. Uh, it's an archive. We use rotational drive. So if you add up the entire weight uh, of of one rack, um, that's that's over a ton. It's about the size of a small car. Okay, and we have many of these. So just some interesting facts there. Uh, the current state, it's alive. It's working right now. Okay, we are actually putting stuff into it. Uh, the total storage between the two sites uh, is about. Um, is 36 petabytes total. Okay, so about 18 per site right now. Uh, we have uh, 44 uh, OSD servers. Okay, uh, the number of JBOS in there is 22, right, with 100 plus uh, drives uh, in each one. So total, we have you know over 2,000 drives uh, that are that are in uh, spread across these two sites. Uh, we got 16 compute nodes. Uh, like I said, doing mostly uh, radars, gateways, and uh, load balancers. Uh, about 20 terabits per second of networking capacity uh, combined between these sites. Uh, every node has 400 gigabits per second um, links to get out of the, uh, the server. Uh, that's uh, for redundancy reason and also for bandwidth reason. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, 200 gigabits per second between the two sites. So remember the criteria we set up for ourselves, you know, because so from the overall economics, if we look at a, a five-year TCO, um, I think we hit the, the, the target. A lot of that is the, um, you know, we, the, the harbor is definitely up from cost, but if you look at the, the five-year uh, amortization of the harbor, um, you know, compared to like a typical 250K per, per petabyte type, you know, cloud cost, uh, we, we come out ahead. And a lot of that is uh, we don't have the overhead of the uh, a lot of the software license that are otherwise required uh, if you were to either build this on prem or use the cloud. Uh, but of course, disclaimer: your mileage may may vary. Right? Our partner has pretty pretty good buying power, uh, and and so uh, depending on your discounts and um, your um, your buying power, like your mileage may 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 vary. Got a question already? <coughs> <laughs> it's approximate. No, so this this is uh, comparing the the uh, public cloud cost. If you were to just you know kind of search the cost on the internet, uh, compared to uh, included in here is the uh, the the, the harbor cost. There are some uh, software costs, overheads, uh, number of people required to operate it, uh, amortize over five years. Okay. All right. And so, what was the pain point? You know how we build it, and you know what we went through. Like um, where the challenges are. So, I mean, Ceph, Ceph is not easy, but that wasn't the main problem. Right? A lot of this is the uh, the the careful planning up front. Like I said, this is not a a, 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 a test environment this is not a cluster we're gonna put together and tear down. Right? This has to last for, for years um, and longer. And so a lot of that is the careful planning uh, up front, uh, planning out the, um, the, the rack elevations, uh, selecting the harbor, uh, both for the initial phase and then for the, uh, the future expansions. Right? And you know, we have to take the cost into consideration. You know? So there's plenty of redundancy, plenty of performance built into the harbor, but you know, we're we, we can't, we don't have infinite uh, uh, budget to, uh, to do this either. Uh, the networking aspect of it uh, as well, you know, I talked about. Uh, and at the end of it, it's just, you know, good old system engineering, right? Uh, it's, it's not just the Ceph aspect of it. Uh, earlier, uh, we heard about uh, how to make things simple, right? To make it more consumable for the users. Uh, so bringing Ceph is one thing, right? Ceph, Ceph has, uh, tons of knobs that you can tune for for uh, 
uh, depending on what how you're using it. Uh, and so we have to it still is down to something that's easier for the operator who's not a Ceph expert to be able to consume and use uh, this uh, environment. And then there are other things that are needed um, um, to, again, make this into a, uh, a service, right? An active archive uh, service that can be consumed. So uh, it takes a lot of other things or a lot of things other than Ceph uh, to make this possible. Uh, so here's just a sample of all the other open source projects that are using this. Uh, uh, to make it uh, possible. Uh, we got stuff that are interacting, you know, at the, uh, the, the hardware level, so directly talking either to the Linux environment, to the hardware, um, orchestrating or taking data out. We got stuff on the, uh, the platform side for orchestrations across the, uh, the, the different servers, right, uh, so that they're, they're managed uh, like clusters. We got stuff that are user interfacing, APIs, GUIs uh, that are written uh, in order to abstract things away and make things uh, simpler. Right. So I'll just give an example. Right. So um, when we have um, stuff that's collected from the um, from the, the OSD nodes, let's say. Right. So we have agents that are running on there. They're collecting the data. Uh, they're being uh, sent back to the um, the microservices that are running on the back end uh, via Kafka. Okay, so we use Kafka as a reliable bus to talk between, um, at least in one direction, uh, getting the, uh, the the metrics back to the, the back end. Over at the back end, we're storing states. So these are states uh, for some of the states for um, for Ceph, some of the desired states for all the applications, their versions, and the configurations for the networking, etc. Uh, the states are stored in uh, Postgres. Okay, so that's what Postgres is there for. Uh, we have uh, metrics that are also coming from this bus that are uh, built into a uh, time series. And so the time series are stored in uh, Prometheus. We're also using Prometheus to generate alarms uh, because we can have guys staring at dashboards uh, all day long, which you know we do provide, uh, but we also want uh, any um, failures or threshold crossings, you know, events of interest uh, to be able to generate automatic uh, email Slack messages uh, to, the, uh, to the operators. Okay, so, um, um, for some of the, um, the the states and metrics, you know that we need fax access because there are a lot of things that are uh, reactions re remediations that are built in. So if something happens, uh, if it's something that the uh, software can remediate, we're not waiting for um, an operator to come in and click buttons, right? So for stuff that are um, requires fast action, right? Requires uh, data to be available. Uh, some of those data are cached in uh, Redis. Um, because the microservices are running across um, uh, in different containers. Okay, so so just storing them in memory, access in the memory isn't sufficient because uh, multiple containers need to access data. So that's what the uh, the, the Redis caching is for. Okay. So that just kind of gives a uh, a sample, like I said, you know, all the the, the stuff that's involved uh, to make this possible. And there's logic that's coordinating all this. Okay, so this is not just uh, uh, scripting and scum guy, you know, running, running uh, uh, scripts by hand. Uh, this is logic that's all built in. It's programmatic, uh, and so we can do a lot more when we're using programmatic um, code like uh, like Go, like Golang, um, to kind of tie all these open source together. So this is where all the uh, determinations of comparing the discover state versus the desired state, you know, does it match? Is it something I can remediate? Or is it something that I need to alarm and have person come in and uh, be involved? Uh, it's the uh, logic for like checking the um, um, uh, the radar's gateways, right? Um, uh, putting the uh, certificates, um, managing the certificates, verifying the certificates, um, user access control, dishing out the uh, credentials for who has access and uh, who doesn't. And then also at different layers, right? Access, you know, we're basically uh, um, RBAC access for infrastructure, for the storage, for the S3, uh, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we got agent collectors that are running on all the nodes uh, that are taking all the, like I said earlier, taking all the data and feeding it back into the, uh, the back end. So, to give a, uh, uh, another example here of uh, uh, kind of a real life, real, real life um, um, example of how, how this came into play. So 
not that long ago, right? So we, we um, in the sandbox, have deployed, um, well, in a sandbox, uh, because it's a sandbox, we tend to do a lot of um, experiments over there. Uh, so we've deployed, we've teared down, we've experimented, we you know create failure scenarios just to test uh, recovery there. So there are usually stuff that's uh, left over in there. Right? We try to clean it up as much as possible. Uh, but um, we didn't realize at the time. So part of the uh, the orchestration is done with uh, Ceph uh, Ansible, right? And so we were trying to remove a node. Uh, using Ceph Ansible to uh, purge a node from um, Ceph. And you know, Ceph Ansible does what it thinks is the right thing. Uh, it wants to purge the OSDs that are belonging to that um, Ceph node, and, but it doesn't query Ceph. It will, goes in there, goes to user lib, um, oh, sorry, uh, var lib, Ceph, um, OSD, and just look for the files in there, assume, hey, there's all your OSDs, you know, let's, let's go purge them. Or it turns out, like I said, there are stuff that are left over. There are OSD in there that are no longer OSDs, or worse yet, there are OSDs in there with tags that are already being used by other OSDs. And so it goes there and just say, yeah, OSD9, okay, remove OSD9, OSD10, remove OSD10. And so it ended up removing OSDs that are actually now belonging in other nodes. Perfect example, great use case for Sandbox. But once we realize that, then uh, it's very easy for us to go change the, the logic. This is where the, the, the power of using you know, language like Go comes in. Right? You can compile quickly, you can change quickly, we can push these updates out uh, uh, quickly. So you know, in a matter of a day or so, right, we can go out there, um, discover right, through our agents all the, the files in there. We can query Ceph, we can compare, uh, make decisions on what are real files in there, what are no longer, you know, um, uh, valid files, stale files that needs to be removed. Uh, we add checks in there to now, okay, well, if you're gonna purge a node, here are the OSDs that you think you're gonna remove. Oh, by the way, before you remove it, let's run software to go compare against what's actually in Ceph uh, before you go and, and uh, execute anything. Okay. So these are the kind of things that uh, the, the logic, again, that's tying not just the, uh, the, the Ceph aspect of it, but all the other peripherals, uh, all the other applications um, uh, the power of what these logic um, um, can do and are actually necessary if you wanted to operate reliably, uh, long-term, uh, and easily uh, in this type of uh, large environment, multi-cluster, multi-site type environment. Okay. All right, so as the wise Master Yoda would say, you know, do or do not, there is no try. Okay. If you're gonna do Ceph, you're gonna use Ceph in the production environment, you have to be committed. Uh, getting started is easy. Okay, making it robust, making it reliable, uh, gets to be more difficult. Uh, but you got to persevere through it. And um, once you get past that, uh, then Ceph is a great platform. Right, it's great not just for storing media archive, but for general purpose storage. This archive I talked about is not only media. Like they're they're, it's they use it for VM backups, they use it for um, any storage, right? And so, so it's a very worthwhile um, um, investment, okay? Uh, system engineering, like I said, all the stuff besides Ceph, uh, in terms of hardware, in terms of networking, in terms of um, other uh, softwares and applications, how are you gonna use it, how are you gonna secure it? Like that's all important things. And again, they need to be planned out, not just for day zero, but long-term for, for um, where you think the, uh, the, the, the clusters are headed. Okay. Uh, and then the automation, the smarts. Okay. So, so I think at any given point in time, we all become experts in some areas of Ceph or something. Uh, you know, it's a bug we're debugging or some features that we're writing. And then we move on to something else and we forgot. We, we forgot how smart we, are, we were you know, two years ago. Uh, but we need to embed those smarts, not just in documentation, but into the software itself. Okay. Hopefully a lot of that is uh, embedded in Ceph itself, you know, Ceph uh, versions uh, progress. Uh, but the stuff that's not in Ceph, you know, the, the, the smarts are required, the interaction between Ceph and, and either the infrastructure itself or the applications, those smarts need to be embedded in uh, software. And that's how 
over generations, you know, as people come and go, as we move on to um, um, newer and better things, that the, uh, the automation remains um, smart, you know, and, and uh, being able to do a lot of things on its own without having to refer back to documentations and, you know, call up the, uh, the original guy that wrote the features and things like that. And then live and die, you know, by the QA uh, and the, uh, the sandboxes. Can't stress the importance of that. Uh, performance tuning, staging, uh, debugging, troubleshooting. Uh, it's a lifesaver for us multiple times, many times over. And, you know, the, the economics, right? Having this environment is all you can eat, right? Once we have this uh, infrastructure uh, running, uh, especially with the sandboxes, like any experiments we wanted to try, anything that we wanted to do, um, it's, it's there. It's there for us. Right? It's all you can eat type of uh, scenario. So um, uh, it's great. Okay. So I'll close there. Uh, again, you know, thank our partners for uh, making this uh, possible. Uh, and I'll take questions. Um. The, the tape to Ceph thing is interesting. What was the business like justification or reason to move things that you said are the crown jewels off of a media like tape onto Ceph? Well, so tape, uh, those of you who have dealt with tape, I mean, it's an aging industry, right? The hardware are harder and harder to come by. The upgrade cycles are tough. Um, you know, and the, the whole upgrade process is crusty at best, at best. Okay. So the motivation there is, if you don't, if you leave it on tape, how much life does it have? Okay. So that's one of the one of the, uh, the the major justification is that well, if you don't do it, you know the uh, there there's actually a, a non-zero chance that the uh, data may not be there anymore uh, years from now. Okay. Then it's just the economics of okay, well, comparing um, tape to uh, rotating drives uh, and you know, the economics of that, and so that's how it was justified. Yes. About how you did the performance tuning uh, for the cluster? Did you end up with like an eight plus three erasure coding? And ah, yes. Thank you. So I uh, forgot to mention that. So uh, the in the production environment, the erasure codings were um, eight four. Okay. So fifty percent overhead. Uh, it was chosen based on the number of racks that were available and their constraints between the racks that are available in one site versus the other. So we could add more racks in one of the sites. But the limitations and wanting to make these identical, that's how we, we, we chose those. And then when we do performance tuning, a lot of that, you know, besides tapping into the community on what's possible is empirical, right? So we do, um, again, we have nice automations for doing that. Uh, being able to, to try the number of uh, Redux Gateway demons, number of demons per node, number of load balancers that we put in front of it. Um, and how those load balancers are distributed. So we ended up with um, um, HA proxy as a load balancer, load balancing radios gateways, three to four of them per server on the same server, and that is a building block repeated, you know, n times, and being as many as we need for the um, the, the type of access. That. Like in the beginning, we're just you know basically taking from tape and throwing it into uh, Ceph. Like we. We try to have many of these, right? Later on, they may get reduced. Okay. So how, how will you um, maintain check consistency between the different sites and also the public cloud as you grow in terms of number of, number of objects stored, amount of data stored, especially after you have some kind of outage anywhere in any of the three? The consistency of the data? Yeah, between the, between the, cop the three copies, basically. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's a good question. That, at the infrastructure level right now, it's, it's difficult, and we're not quite doing it there at the, the infrastructure in terms of, you know, querying Ceph. Like, so the, the media manager that you're seeing uh, over on top there, like how the data, data are replicated and which site they sit in and whether they're consistent or actually being done at the higher level. Yeah. So uh, you're saying that replication is done by higher layers of software, That's right. Correct? So we're not, we actually did play with the, uh, the Ceph replication at one point, uh, doing the across the two sites. Uh, but of course, maybe in 
coming up later, we will have it. But right now, this Ceph doesn't have the ability to go go replicate itself into a public cloud. Right? Mm -hmm. So the higher layer is needed anyway. And so mm -hmm. that just became the, um, the, the de facto. Um, so this is not so much of a question. I think this is an excellent project. I like to have a post a question to the rest of the team here that I know you say that tape is aging technologies, but <laughs> I want to let you know that uh, tape actually, you know, because we have the uh, tape business, I can tell you the tape right now, the business is growing like crazy because of the, the hyperscalers. I mean, you just too much data, you know, in order to uh, prevent the climate change, <laughs> uh, you need to find a way to sustain it. Again, your project is great. Okay. So what we are thinking about is whether we can come up with the, but the problem is tape, you know, it's the interface is, is hard to use. I mean, you know, think about you get somebody, uh, some kids from the, you know, college, you know, ask them tape. But my son have no idea what rewind means in the, in, you know, there's a forward and rewind. What is rewind? Rewind what? Right. So we're thinking about whether we can put an object storage interface in front of tape to make tape to be more consumable. The problem is not so much tape technology is aging. It's the tape is hard to use and hard to manage. If we were to put the object interface in front of tape, whether we can solve that problem. I know, sorry, that this is independent of your well, projects, but I just, well, I, just pose the question. That's a valid. That's a valid approach, right? Yeah. And, and like I said, it's a question is not just for me, it's to the, the team there. You know, yeah. I think I think the economics of it um, and maybe the environmental aspect of it definitely makes sense. Uh, but for other consideration, you know, just to um, um, keep it in mind as well, right? So so it is also about the, the axis, you know, the, the fast axis and also Correct. random axis, any part of the data. Sometimes we're accessing, you know, even parts of a file. Correct. Right, not even so, file. you know, we even think about how do we do erasure coding across tape? Because right. again, just the sheer amount of data is too big and we need to figure out maybe they're different between the warm archive and co-archive. Yep. Okay. This is just a question, not a directly with, you know, to your project. One more. Yep. You, uh, you mentioned random access to parts of files just now. Uh, do you see Seth giving you any advantages over tape uh, in this project that you can talk about? Well, yeah, definitely, right? So right now, just, just putting the entire um, uh, petabytes of data into Ceph compared to robot arms, you know, going in there and fetching a tape, you know. Yeah, I imagine. Already, already that's an improvement, a huge yeah. improvement. Uh, like in the tape, there are cache, so there are um, servers uh, and uh, rotational drive there that are caching it, but, you know, it's not this size. Right. Yeah. Now we have the entire content on Ceph. Cool, cool. Right. Well, some of that is, is also for the future. Like um, uh, the purpose of those SSDs, part of it is uh, so that the, uh, the metadata uh, can be, be stored there. Uh, um, but we do have expansion slots available uh, on those OSD servers. Um, so there are talks of, it is again, beauty of Ceph. Like we can have massive petabytes of data on rotational drive, but we can have smaller pools that are on, let's say, uh, NVMe SSDs only, right? And we do want to see like, what kind of performance we can squeeze out of it. Uh, and perhaps, you know, in addition to being archived, some of the, uh, the primary storage can come on there as well. So that's what they are there for. Uh, well, so the some of the tests we do for reliability is um, to protect against failures, and so we do try to mimic things like a hardware failure or drive failure. And you know, it's the project has been around for a couple of years now, so we do actually have real hardware failure and real drive failures in production environment that we had to 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 um, um, to go resolve. So I don't have the numbers in terms of the actual, uh, you know, how many nines if we were to tally up all the run times and the, um, the, uh, um, and the number of times that um, uh, we, we encounter issues. But, you know, we haven't had lots of data in the production environment. 
Okay. Thank you very much.